This conversation I was having with my friend was, uh, we were talking about the Bible and, and, and the conversation kind of went the direction of what is the most important verse or verses in the Bible, right? So I, I rattled off a few that, that are most important to me at the very least. And the one that first always comes to mind for me and has always come to mind since the very beginning of my Christian walk uh, comes from 2 Corinthians 5.17. And it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The, the old has gone, right? The old has passed away and the new has come. And, and that's been uh, kind of my spiritual life verse since I became a Christian uh, all the way back in college when I was 19. And then uh, the next verse that came to mind as I was talking about him, I said, Genesis 1-1, of course. Uh, in the beginning, God created the, the heavens and the earth. I mean, that, that's foundational. You've got to get that, right? And then the next verse that came to mind was John 1-1. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word means Jesus. There, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Incredibly important. And then the next verse that I said, I said, I said John 3-17. And my friend said, oh... Hold on a second there. When I said John 3, 17, he said, why, why that one, right? Well, indeed, why that one? For God did not send His Son into the world that He might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Right? I shared that this might be the most important verse in the New Testament. Now, that, of course, is quite a claim to make, especially knowing what verse this comes immediately after, right? Everybody knows John 3.16. You see it in every football game at the end zone, right? Some guys standing there holding up John 3.16 every time they kick a field goal or an extra point in, in football, which, which I think is cool. That's a good thing. Praise God that he's put people to places to do that. But everybody knows John 3.16. But in some ways, John 3.17 suffers from some understandable neglect as it comes on the heels of what Martin Luther called the very heart of the Bible. Or, or Martin Luther also called John 3.16 the, the gospel in miniature, right? And nothing that I can say today in my text will take away from the glory of John 3.16. But these verses, they go together and they cannot be separated. And we can state the problem in a, in a different way. A, a recent survey... Uh, in 2018 showed that Jeremiah 29.11 was the most searched for verse online out of the Bible. Jeremiah 29.11. That's Hannah's favorite verse, by the way, if you don't know that. And, and, and that's well and good. and It's completely understandable that people might, might want to look up Jeremiah 29.11. But, but raise your hand if you know what Jeremiah 29.10 says. Anybody know that one? Offhand, without looking at your Bible? Cheating? Right? Yeah, most of us only know one verse from all of Jeremiah 29. And so it is often the same with John 3. We know that one verse, John 3.16. But John 3.17. But even though we don't necessarily always know that verse, I still think it may be the most important verse in all of the New Testament. In fact, John 3.17 is the reason that we are going to heaven. Or, or to make it more personal, if you are going to heaven. John 3.17 is the very reason. Outside of this verse, we have no hope whatsoever. No one goes to heaven if John 3.17 is not true. Now with that as our kind of bold beginning, maybe I've piqued your curiosity, let's look at what this verse says about the purpose of Christ's coming. And you're going to see, if you're following along in your sermon notes, it contains good news, better news, and then the best news of all. So first, the good news, right? The good news is, God did not send Christ to condemn you. For God did not send His Son into the world that He might condemn the world, it says. Christ didn't come to condemn you. And if you're not happy about that, you need to take a closer look in the mirror, frankly. If, if, we could, if we could see ourselves as God sees us, we would understand fully the meaning of where Paul says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned, right? And the Bible says this in many different ways in many different places. It says, like sheep, we have all gone astray. 
We have turned to our own way. We have missed the mark. We have disobeyed. We have ignored the God who made us. We have rebelled against His law. We have followed our own desires. We have turned to idolatry. We have called evil good and we've called good evil. We've played around. We've slept around. We've lied. We've cheated. We've murdered. We've brazenly declared our independence from God. We, we've, we've cheered on even evil doers in this world. We've denounced those who've warned us. We've hated those who have tried to tell us no. We've redefined sin so that it didn't seem to be so bad. We've laughed at the very idea of hell. We've mocked the idea of judgment. We've dreamed evil schemes. We've lusted after forbidden fruit. We've boasted about our sins. And if you think this doesn't apply to you, well, think again, because those words describe the whole of human race. When John 3.17 says Jesus did not come to condemn the world, it doesn't mean that the world didn't deserve condemnation. But you see, Jesus didn't have to condemn us because we had already condemned ourselves. See, Jesus didn't come to a morally neutral planet. Jesus came into a world that was in active rebellion against God. When Chuck Colson, many of you know Chuck, or know of Chuck, when Chuck Colson received the 1993 Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion, he had the opportunity to speak to an audience at the University of Chicago, and he spoke on the enduring revolution. And in describing the plight of modern society, Colson mentioned four different myths that define our times. He called them the, the four horsemen of the present apocalypse. And the first one that he talked about, the first myth that he brought up is the myth of the goodness of man. This myth, it deludes people into thinking, he said, that, 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 that we're always the victims, that we're never the villains. That we're always deprived and we're never depraved. And he went on to say that it dismisses the responsibility that we should have to be responsible, that idea, it dismisses that as the teaching of a, of a darker age, a time of the past. He said this, this myth can excuse any crime because it can always blame something else. He said that it's a, a sickness of our society or something that's a, a sickness of our minds rather than something personal. And to illustrate this truth, Colson told the story of the Holocaust survivor Yehiel Denur. Uh, whose testimony was given uh, during the Nuremberg war trials. Uh, he, he was one of the people who spoke against Adolf Eichmann. And Eichmann, if you don't know, was the architect of the Nazis' final solution during World War II. Eichmann presided over the slaughter of millions of people. And it says, he says, the court was hushed as the victim confronted the butcher. Suddenly, Denur says, broke down in uncontrollable sobs, and he collapsed on the floor while he was giving his testimony. When, when later asked to explain his actions, he said, I was afraid about myself. He said, as I was looking at Eichmann, I saw that I too am capable of doing this, that I am exactly like he. The reporter who interviewed Denur concluded that the most chilling fact about Adolf Eichmann was that in all other appearances, he was completely normal. That Eichmann is in all of us. That line between evil and good is a very thin one for each and every one of us. <coughs> Jeremiah 17 reminds us, 17.9 in fact, Jeremiah 17.9 reminds us that the heart is deceitful above all things. And it is desperately sick. Who can understand it? You see, folks, we are sick because of sin. And, and the disease is 100% fatal. It is. Sin has infected each and every human heart, and no one can escape it. Does anyone know the, the last phrase of Roman 3.22? Again, that's one of those, you always know 3.23, for all sin and fallen short of the glory of God. A lot of us don't know about 22, right? 
The last phrase of 22 is key, though, to understanding 23. It says simply, for there is no difference. And that explains this famous statement in Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That, that no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, we are all sinners desperately in need of God's grace. There's no difference between the rich and the poor. There's no difference between the young and the old. There's no difference between black and white, male or female. There's, there's no difference between any of us when it comes to sin. We all stand condemned by our sins. And all of us are under the judgment of God. Our sins might not be exactly the same, but we are all sinners nonetheless. We are all in the very same boat. And that boat is sinking. And if, if God doesn't do something, the whole human race will go down in destruction. And that is where John 3.17 becomes so crucial in our understanding and thinking. Jesus could have come to condemn the world. Jesus could have come to condemn us because we deserved condemnation. But he didn't do that. You see, our words, our words condemn us, and rightly so. Our thoughts condemn us. Our deeds condemn us. Jesus didn't have to add to our condemnation. He came because we were condemned already. You can see John 3.18 for a little more on that. You see, Jesus came to offer us life instead of death, hope instead of despair, light instead of darkness. Jesus says, all who are weary, come to me and I will give you rest. Horatio, Horatio Bonar, he wrote these words in 1846 and some of you know of his hymns. He said, I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one. Lay down your head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, so weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. It's a good old song by Horatio Bonar. So there is great hope for us in John 3.17. But first, we must start where Jesus starts. If we make excuses and we pretend that we aren't so bad off, we will never find that rest in Jesus. That rest that Jesus promises is for us. You can't be forgiven until you admit that you are a sinner. Only the sick need a doctor. And only a sinner needs a savior. That's the good news of our text. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. But there's even better news straight ahead. The better news is that God sent Christ to save you. 317b says, but that the world might be saved through him, through Jesus. Luke 19.10 tells us, The Son of Man came to seek and save who? The lost, right? What, what is our Lord like? Our Lord is like the woman who lost a coin and searched her entire house until she found it. He's like a man who lost one sheep and left the other 99 behind to go find that one. He is like a father who welcomed his prodigal son home again. He came seeking sinners up a tree, right? He came seeking sinners at midnight, at Jacob's well. Jesus came seeking those caught in adultery, blind beggars, lepers, wild men living in tombs. He even came seeking the self-righteous Pharisees who didn't think that they needed him. He came seeking fishermen, politicians, radicals, physicians, tax collectors, rich men, the people on top of the heap, the poor folks that nobody would touch. He sought the prostitutes, the, the drunkards, and they loved him for it. And when he was dying, he even came seeking one 
who was hanging on a cross right next to him. This means that the worst among us can be saved. Do not put any limits on what God can do on His grace. As, as Corey Ten Boom liked to say, there is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. Corey Ten Boom knew something about that. God has more grace in His heart than you will ever have sin in your life. Jesus is a better saver, Savior than you are a sinner. Hear that again. Jesus is a better Savior than you are a sinner. You don't have to be a prisoner to your past. In Christ, you can rise above your past. Your past no longer has to define you. And God through that can, can, can be glorified and much great glory can be made of Him. Some of you know the, the gospel song, To God Be the Glory, right? And it contains an encouraging line. It says, The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Sometimes it's hard to believe that though, isn't it? I mean, who among us would be the very first one to say, yeah, go ahead and play back an unaltered transcript of my life for everybody to watch? Anybody? You want to be the first one to volunteer for that movie? I don't want you watching mine, I can tell you that. Because there are, are things that are better left unsaid and unseen and unspoken from our past. We all labor under that sense of sin. Those sins that even this week that we have committed, right? Uh, of duties left undone. Of careless or cutting words that we wish we could take back. Of, of deliberate greed. Or foolish choices made in haste. But it is the glory of the gospel that, that no matter how bad your sins might possibly be, that you can be saved nonetheless, even right now. You see, your past does not have to determine your future when Jesus enters into the picture. If you qualify as lost, then you are an excellent candidate for salvation. If you are a sinner... Christ came seeking you. And now for the best news. You can be saved through Christ. If we study this verse, John 3.17, word by word, if we translate it from the Greek and do all those things, if we read what the commentators say about it, if we spend hours and hours checking all the cross-references, if we do all of that but we don't make it personal, We've missed the very point of Jesus' words. This is not just a, a general statement about why Jesus came to earth. We, each and every one of us, need to ask what these words have to do with me personally. Let's see if we can get at that first personal part by looking at two aspects of this verse. First, the word world. The word world is used three different times in John 3.17. And that's a striking fact, if, fact if, you, if you think about it a little bit, right? Christ has come into the world. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came that the world, through Him, might be saved. This suggests the universality of, of Christ's mission. He came to a world that was in rebellion against God. He came to a prodigal planet. And decided, I need to do some work here because they are trying to go their own way. The word world in this context means something like a world gone bad. Imagine you get to heaven and there above the pearly gates, right, is a sign that says, for sinners only. Right? If you qualify... Come on in. Because Jesus died for sinners. And this place is only for sinners. But there is a second truth that we must also face. And it's this. It's that salvation is only through God. Through Jesus. Through Him. 
This suggests that there is an exclusivity to the gospel. That there is only one way and one way only to heaven. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that verse is not popular with many people in our culture and society. Because it sounds too narrow in these politically correct times, doesn't it? We would be comfortable if Jesus said, I am a way, but not the way. We would be happy if he said that, right? But it's okay if you decide your own way. I'm just one of the ways. Many paths must lead to heaven, right? I was watching a TV show once, a talk show, and the host was describing kind of his idea of who would be saved. And he said something like this. He said, I believe God is so loving that when he looks at my life, he'll just say, shake his head and say, Ah, oh, come on in. Right? That's what the host said. But certainly, that TV host speaks for multitudes today who hope against hope that, that somehow, some way, they're going to make it to heaven in the end, right? But we must not deceive ourselves on a topic of eternal importance. The other day while checking out at the grocery store, clerk asked me, she said, you know, she's swiping my things through at Paul back. She says, what are you doing this weekend? Right? Innocent question. Could have asked anybody, she asked me. Just a question to simply engage in conversation while we're both enduring the mundane of checking out all the junk I'm going to eat for the next week, right? And she wanted to know, are you guys going to the lake? Because I had some hot dog buns and some, some brats and some other stuff. Are you, are you going to the lake? Are you grilling? And, and even before I could answer, she began telling me of, of her plans of, of who was coming and, and what they were going to be eating for supper on Saturday and, and how she hopes to catch a fish. And, 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 and after she kind of had talked through the entirety of checking out all of my groceries, despite having asked me the question, I finally admitted towards the end that I really didn't have big plans beyond doing some yard work for my weekend, which I did get most of my lawn mowed. So, hey, I won. But uh, here's the point. That was just a casual conversation. And many people will discuss eternity kind of in that casual sort of way. Kind of like we would, what are your plans for this weekend? Well, what are your plans for eternity? Right? But this weekend is just a few hours of my life. Well, eternity is forever. These words of Jesus are both an invitation as well as a warning. God invites the whole world to be saved. That is the good news of the gospel. But that invitation has a condition. Salvation is only through Christ. You cannot rewrite the invitation to make it say, or through good works, right? Or, or, or through baptism and confirmation, or, 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 or by being in the right family, or, or even by attending the right church. No. God offers salvation through Christ and only through Christ. But it's easy to put off making a decision, isn't it? But this is not something that we should procrastinate. I read about a pastor once who went to the gas station at the start of a very busy holiday weekend. He was going to just fill up his truck's tank with gas. But when he got there, he discovered there was a, a super long line of people waiting to do the very same thing. And when he finally got to the pump, there was an employee who was like, you know, changing the garbages or whatever. And the employee, you know, must have known the pastor. And he said, ah, pastor, I, I'm sorry, but it seems like everybody must have just waited until the very last minute to get ready for these trips that they all knew they were going to be taking. And the pastor just kind of smiled, nodded his head and said, I know what you mean. I've got the same problem in my business. <laughs> Jesus came so that the world might be saved through him. And that certainly includes you and me, because we are part of the sinful world for which Christ died. 
And at some point, we have to do the business with the Son of God. And you can't put that off forever. C.S. Lewis framed it this way. He said, look for yourself and you will find it in the long run. Only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find Him. And with Him, everything else gets thrown in. You see, Jesus stands at the end of life's road waiting for all of us. And there can be no middle ground. To ignore Him is the very same thing as to hate Him. Because you end up without Him either way. But none of us can ignore Him forever. We all have an appointment with Christ sooner or later. Let me suggest what John 3.17 should say to us today. First, it means that we will never meet a hopeless sinner. To be sure, we will meet men and women who who feel that their situation is hopeless. I I met with a guy years ago. Uh, He had feared that he had committed the unpardonable sin. In In a fit of rage, he had cursed God and said that he no longer believed. But now he he was deeply convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit. He had sought to find peace with God, but he feared that all hope was gone. And, And I relayed to him and I told him that even a man who had blasphemed God could be saved because Christ did not condemn him. That's not why he came, but Christ came to save him. In a sense, this man proved the very truth of John 3, 17, because he had already condemned himself by confessing his foul blasphemy, he was now an excellent candidate for the grace of God. We all know that the the night seems darkest just before the dawn. So it was for this man, as the Holy Spirit was working in his heart. But I told him that if he turned to Christ and if he asked Christ for mercy, that he too could be saved from all of his sins, including his sin of blasphemy. That could be forgiven, even that. No pit is deeper than the grace of God. Let us take this truth to heart as we share Christ with others. You have never met a hopeless sinner, and you never will. As long as there is life, there is hope, because Christ died and rose again. Anyone, anywhere, in any situation can be saved if they will only turn from their sin and trust Christ as their Savior. Now there is a second truth in this that's equally glorious. And it's this. The gospel that saves us, it saves others also. If we are honest, apart from Christ, we are all hopeless sinners, right? Because our sins have condemned us, all of us, each and every one of us, myself included. Our sins stand like a a mighty mountain separating us from God. And it's too high for us to climb, it's too deep for us to tunnel under, and it's far, far too wide for us to walk around it. Only a supernatural power can remove our mountain of sin. But that's what the gospel does. It removes the mountain, not just some of it, but all of it. Not over time, but instantaneously. And it happens in that moment when we trust Christ. So let's tell the world of this amazing news. God did not send His Son to condemn you. He sent His Son to save you. You can be saved through Christ. There's enough gospel in John 3.17 to save the whole world. And it's that verse that explains why John 3.16 is true. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. He sent His Son Jesus so that the world might be saved through Him. That whoever believes in Him will not perish, but shall inherit eternal life. 
these two verses fit together perfectly. Folks, let's believe them both and let's share them both because this is the good news that the world needs to hear. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, again, we are humbled by your grace, by your mercy. God, today we are challenged by the reminder that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. That we have, like sheep, gone astray. And God, it is such a powerful day that we can come before you together and worship and song and word and then now coming together at a time of communion where we are reminded very clearly, starkly of the depths of your great love for us. God, while we were sinners, when we didn't even know we needed, you came to earth, lived a life we could not live, died a death we could not die, and you went to the cross, and then you died and rose again, ascended into heaven, conquering sin and death in the grave, so that we could be restored to you. Father God, in this moment, we just pray that if there's someone who's never taken this to heart, has never understood this fully, that maybe today, Lord, would be the day that they would see that they are a sinner just like the rest of us. We are all sinners. That they are in need of a Savior. That they are the problem, not the solution. We cannot free ourselves from the bondage of sin. We keep messing up. We keep screwing it up. We keep just ruining everything. But the good news is you didn't come to condemn us in that. You came to love us, to free us. So God, as sinners, each and, one, each and every one of us, we admit we are sinners in need of a Savior. If we've never done that before right now, we just, God, we pray that you would come into our hearts, that we would put our hope and trust in you for salvation, for eternity, that you are the one and the only one who leads to eternal life, that you are the only one who can take away our sins, that you are the only one who can restore the relationship we have broken. And then God, in that, as we find your grace and mercy, may your blessing be upon us. May we know the freedom from our past. Our past does not have to define our future. For in Christ Jesus, we have been made new. God, in this day, if there's those who have taken that step of faith, we rejoice. All of heaven rejoices. We praise you for that. But God, each and every one of us, as we come to the communion table, must search our hearts. God, we all have sinned. So Lord, we confess those sins to you. We thank you that you forgive us continually. And God, we pray that you would lead us on a better path as we move forward. Lord God, as we continue in this time of worship, may your blessing be upon us. We thank you and love you and praise you in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.